The patients that benefit the most from enteral feeding are the critically ill patient because it is that patient that is rapidly losing their nutrition support. They're losing nitrogen, they're losing uh, the proteins, they're actually starting to use their own endogenous proteins, they're breaking down their own organs in order to feed themselves if we don't provide them enteral nutrition. We know that feeding enterally is physiologic, it's normal, and we know that there's lower infection rates, um, there's lower complication rates with enteral feedings. The gut is working at all, we want to feed enterally. Patients that are in the ICU that require enteral feedings are a myriad of disease states. This would include patients that are in septic shock. These are trauma patients, anybody who's experienced a motor vehicle trauma, um, a fall, motorcycle accident, a burn like I take care of, patients with severe pancreatitis, uh, patients in any form of respiratory failure, whether they have an underlying disease like asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, patients who come in with pneumonias, so many of our patients here, whether it be related to trauma or to their burns or whatever, frequently have stasis of their stomach and they don't empty their stomach well. Another reason why we like to try to feed beyond the stomach if we can uh, with uh, enteral feeding tubes um, to provide nutrition and also to provide uh, gastric suction so that we can lower the, the risk for aspiration and such as that. There's less disruption in all the mechanisms that are related to feeding and the gut because the gut is actually connected to the brain uh, and if you lose those mechanisms by not feeding the gut then it creates a cascade of events that potentially can be detrimental to the patient. In other words, these patients are fed within the beginning, within the first few days of arrival, and they continue their feedings unless there's something clinically that would stop us from feeding them throughout their course in the hospital. So it helps us get them better. It helps us at least try to stay ahead of their protein loss. As you can tell, there's two, there's two different diameters to the feeding tube. There's a larger bore uh, diameter right here that we leave in the stomach, and then there's a transition right here that we like to place in the, and leave it in the antrum of the stomach. This smaller tube then is what's advanced down into the distal duodenum or into the jejunum. The jejunum is past what's called the ligamentum of trites. This is the marker in the small bowel where we want to get feedings to the patient because it's that portion of the small bowel that allows the greatest absorption of nutrients without any problems and true aspirations. There's an opening here that this will go into the stomach and that port stays in the stomach so that we can decompress the stomach, in other words, take any fluids or excess air out of there, or we can deliver medications. And because of the radio opaqueness of the tube, we can then take an abdominal film, what we call a KUB, to look for positioning of the tube. So if we're concerned that the tube is not functioning properly, we can just get an x-ray and know within minutes exactly where, where the tube is, being, is placed and whether it's properly placed or not. We try to get down and get these tubes placed as quickly as we can in the uh, critically ill patients here in the burn unit. So what I'm doing here is I'm lubing up the uh, nasal jejunal tube. The nurse and the endoscopy tech are there to help me place the tube because it goes so much easier when you have the techs there and the nurses there that have put in hundreds of these. We uh, will advance the enteral tube through the left nair and we uh, try to position it in the hypopharynx. Then I'll take the endoscope and advance it through the mouth into the hypopharynx. We lubricate the scope and the tubes both really well to try to minimize any resistance between the two. He has a lot of uh, upper airway edema and in these patients a lot of times it can be difficult to uh, see uh, anatomic landmarks clearly. But we follow the uh, endotracheal tube down into the hypopharynx. And then as soon as the tube uh, slides easily down into the esophagus, we'll intubate the esophagus with the endoscope. And now we're in the esophagus and you can see the tube uh, just ahead of us there, uh, down at the six o'clock position. As we advance the endoscope here, down into the stomach, uh, the tech is advancing the tube at the same rate. And as you can see, it's got a large amount of fluid here in the 
uh, fundus of the stomach and the proximal body, so we'll try to remove as much of that as possible. So here we're advancing down into the uh, gastric antrum. When you do get down here as quickly as you can, sometimes the patient unfortunately has eaten relatively recently and we can run into food products sometimes. If they've got a lot of food or contents in their stomach, it can limit visualization, but we'll um, try to irrigate and remove as much of this as possible so that we can see better and then uh, advance the tube at that point. Now we've finally gotten past the greens and the pylorus and we're in the duodenal bulb now. With the tip of the endoscope, we can deflect the tip of the feeding tube and steer it. We'd like for the tube to be as straight as possible. Now we're turning into the second portion of the duodenum. And as we advance the, the endoscope, the tube will usually follow us right down. Coordination between the tech and the endoscopist is really important. Here we see it sliding down into the more distal duodenum. And at this point, uh, I'm removing the stylet from the, uh, the tube and we will uh, then flush the tube to make sure that it flushes easily and we're ready to remove the endoscope. So at this point, we decompress the stomach and again, that can cause the, the tube to migrate a little bit more distally. And then we pull the, the endoscope out. And sometimes as we, as we pull out, we'll twist the endoscope back and forth so that the, the two tubes, uh, the endoscope and the feeding tube don't stick to each other and inadvertently uh, pull the feeding tube out. The main uh, point about the critically ill population and burns is that we know that by feeding them early, we can alter outcome. It is a portion of the total uh, ability to get these patients better. In other words, without early enteral feeding, they will not recover and survive as well as they would with it. It's a really nice tube because it's very functional. Uh, and it's relatively easy to place as well. It provides a consistency. It allows us to feed our patients postpylorically very early, which is part of the critical nature of their survival. And it is a very safe tube, and that's why I consider it the gold standard.